welcome you this morning to our Sunday morning service. I'm sure we can see some visitors back here with us today. And we sure appreciate your presence. Amen. Some I know, some I probably hope to know and don't know. <laughs> but uh, we just want to welcome you and trust you to be blessed today through the music and, and the word of God. We well, come to worship the Lord this morning. I want you to feel free to, to worship Him. So we'll just allow the Lord to speak to your heart and we'll uh, pray and ask God to bless the service and, and everything that's done. We honor and glorify His name. Our Father, we do thank you this morning for the privilege that we have on this another Lord's Day to come out and, and uh, meet together in your house. And we just ask you, Father, to bless us with your presence and may the Spirit of God be very real in all that we do from the time we begin our singing, as uh, we already have in our Greek language, but as we take the hymn book and begin to worship you and praise you through the songs. Father, we bless our visitors and and may this be a good, a good day, a good time for them, Lord, as they've come to the house of God. Certainly we love you, and we praise you and thank you for what you do for us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. 
And it's a blessing to be here and a blessing to see you. I want you to take your Bible this morning. We're going to turn over to the Old Testament in the book of Numbers, chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21. We've been spending some time in the Old Testament looking at some types of the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people think, well, we've got to go to the book of the New Testament to find Christ. But uh, we've been looking at the fact you can find him starting in the book of Genesis. And basically, you can find him all the way through the Old Testament in type. And many times he showed up in the person of the angel of the Lord. And so this morning we're going to be looking at Numbers chapter 21. And uh, we're going to read several verses uh, Start in verse number four, just for the context of what we're going to get into here. And so Numbers chapter 21, verse 4. The Bible says that they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. The people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And I and the Lord spake or sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent. Set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh up on it, shall live. Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten a man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Father, well, we ask you to bless the reading of your word this morning. Bless it. Use it in a special way to speak to our hearts. We certainly love you. We thank you for loving us. And we just ask you to bless the service in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. As we look at this particular portion of the word of God, I have this title of the message this morning. A type of Calvary. A type of the cross. And that's really what it's all about. And as we've already said, finding Jesus in the book of Numbers this morning, as well as other books of the Old Testament in type, well, we can see this morning uh, a type of, of the Lord and the servant on the pole. And someone said, well, how in the world is that going to be a truth? Well, if I would ask you this morning, how many of you have ever memorized or would be able this morning to quote the book of John, chapter 3, looking down in verse number uh, oh, I guess uh, let's, let's, let's think about this. In John chapter number 3, how many of you know what the Bible says in verse number 16? Did you quote it? How many of you quote that for me this morning? We'll not take the time. But could you quote that? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You probably read it, memorized it, and thought about it. I wonder if you ever thought about verse 14. Have you read that and skipped over? And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Well, where's that now? Numbers chapter number 4. 21 to 40. Now, you find it in these verses that I read this morning. So that, what he did then was a type of what Jesus was going to do at Calvary. 
And it's all because God so loved the world. He loves everybody. Isn't he? And we know we started out with them Jewish people, but he included us Gentiles also. He loves everybody. And in the response of his love for the world, he did something that nobody else could do. He put his son to death on an old rugged cross that we through him could live. So I want you to think about that this morning as we <coughs> read this portion of the Word of God and think about it. <coughs> and I'm not going to spend a lot of time in numbers, but I'll spend some. But I want you to, I want you to think about this with me as we go. The Bible says in verse number four, the Bible says, they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea and they come back to the land of Edom. Uh, the Bible says, and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I, I think about us today. We get weary, don't we? We even get discouraged in a way. There's not many of us want to admit it. These people admitted it. And they began to speak and they began to get completely discouraged and aggravated to the point that the Bible said that they spake against God and against Moses. And I don't know about you, but that's a pretty foolish thing to do when you start speaking against God. Especially when he's done a lot for you. But the Bible said in a, in, in, as a result of that, God got pretty aggravated with them. In verse number six, he sent the fiery serpents to bite them. And the Bible said uh, that was a Bad situation. But I want you to know this one more kind of hit verse 7 a little bit and we'll go down. Here's what the people have done and what everybody must do if they're going to want God's blessing. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. You know, you can't even get saved unless you come to a point in your life where you realize you're a sinner and you ask God to forgive your sins and come in and take control of your life. That's right. He said, not only have we sinned against the Lord, but we've sinned against you, Moses. You are our, you're our leader. You're, you're the one that's been with us all this time. So he said, we want you to pray for us. Pray to the Lord. And ask the Lord to take these serpents away. And Moses prayed for the Lord. He prayed for them. He, he talked to the Lord. <clears throat> now I have already said that this whole situation is a picture or a type of Christ when he went to Calvary. But you know what? Moses had walked with them, and I thought about the life of Jesus when he was here on this earth and how he walked in the tabernacle for some three to three and a half years. <clears throat> and how men walked with him and men followed him and, and all that was going on. Though he had one of the bunch that was a traitor and betrayed him. And even the people of Israel who was looking for their Messiah could not see that he was that Messiah. Moses, at this particular time, portrayed a type of Christ. You will never find where Moses railed against the people in this whole incident of their journey in the wilderness. Every time they complained and bust and grind and mourn, what did he do? He went to the Lord. He went to the Father and prayed for them. And I want you to, I'm just going to read this for you. You won't have to turn over here. But in the book of Luke, here is a, here is a beautiful picture in, in, in verse in Luke chapter 23. And that and that in, in verse 24. And it is at a particular time that we that will relate to this whole situation of serpent on the pole. The Bible tells us in chapter 23, verse 24. Actually 23. It says that when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and a male factor, one on the right hand, one on the left. And all of the people of Israel, all of their leadership, all of the people around there, they were crying, crucifying, crucifying. Did Jesus rail on them? No. What did he do? Verse 34 of that chapter. Very calmly, very humbly, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They parted his raiment and cast lots. What did Moses do? 
I related back to that. I thought, Moses, they accused the Lord. That was horrible. They accused him. That was bad. But he didn't do anything. They asked him to pray. And the Bible says that Moses prayed for the people. He humbled himself and prayed. He did not go against them. That's a, that's a time of Christ. You know that. But as we look on down, the Bible says that God told him what to do. He said in that verse number 8, the Lord said to Moses, you make a serpent, a fiery serpent, and you set it on a pole, and it shall come to pass that every man that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. You know what that was a type of? That was a type of God's grace providing for them a sacrifice on that pole. That's right. He was going to be lifted up for them. I mean, they the Lord could have said, you, you, you know, you know what? You're going to have to, you're going to have to do some praying. You're going to have to do some getting right. You're going to have to do some good works. You're going to have to confess all of this mess of mourning and groaning. He did not do that. He did not do that. All a person had to do was what they did. Confess that they had sinned and ask for some help. <laughs> ask for God to do something for them. That's asking for help, isn't it? And so what happened? The Bible tells us that he told them here in his first day. He said that everyone that is bitten, when he looked up upon it, shall live. How simple is that? After all of their grumbling, all of their griping, all of their being weary of everything that's going on, I can understand that. I get weary sometimes, don't you? No, you know, you know this is me. <laughs> the journey gets hard sometimes. It gets hard because of physical health. It gets hard of what you face, even in situations that I don't even want to discuss with you, amen? But you know what, I just keep talking to my Lord. He didn't promise me a bed of ease. He didn't promise me that everything would go smooth every day. But I know he's still with me. Amen. Even when sickness comes, when problems come to the point that the one you love is telling you she's dying and she's going up. And even afterward, looked me in the eye and told me, I had already left my mind. As you pray, I can't thank you. God is gracious. God is loving. Never should we complain to God about anything. We are to praise Him for His grace. Praise Him for loving us and bringing us through this wilderness journey. Folks, we are on a wilderness journey. And this life is short. And it will soon be over. Let us praise Him. Let us look to the God of heaven. Let us look to the God of grace and mercy. Look, let us look to the God of provision. He made provision for these Jewish people who complained and even was aggravated with him. And they realized, they realized, Lord, we have sinned against you. That's what we've got to do is realize we've sinned. So God instructed Moses. And so Moses made the pole, the serpent, put him on a pole and lifted him up. And the Bible says in that verse, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he, talking about you and I, he of the, of the nation of Israel, when that individual looked at that serpent on the pole, he lived. I think about that. Think about all that God did for a people. Even though he had fed them, watered them, protected them, watched over them. It's unbelievable, folks. And, and we're going to look at it again next week as we look in the book of Deuteronomy. And we're going to go into a little more depth and detail of how God was with them and how he led them and all that went on. And every bit of that was a type of Christ. He's with us today. I don't want to get too much. I'll be in the next week's message. Amen. <laughs> but I just want you to see the comparison. You can read in the Old Testament. If you've read that, 
If you read the book of Numbers, and I'm sure some of you have, if you read that, if you wasn't paying attention, you read right over that, went on to the next verse, and never really realized what it was saying. That was a, you, you remember I've told you over and over again, the book of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, God promised a Savior. He promised the Messiah. He promised Jesus is coming. There in that third chapter of Genesis, verse number 15, well, he showed up all the way from the Old Testament for Israel, and he showed up for us at Calvary. What a day. What a day. He came. So as we look at this and we think about all that God done for the nation of Israel and how he went with them and walked with them, I want you to turn now over to John chapter 3. Turn over there. And, and we're going to just read that one verse over and then we're going to go on down uh, in the next verses. But I want you to see this. I, I want this to get in your mind. I want you to understand it. I want you, when you go back and read the numbers, the first thing that will jump out in your mind, that serpent on the pole represented the coming Christ who would die at Calvary. It was tiny. Then people were going to die. That poison from the snake was like sin in a man's life who is unsaved is going to die and, and spend an eternity away from God. So as we look here in John chapter 3, verse 14, the Bible says in verse 14, he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, the very next phrase, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Then you talk about a key to an Old Testament passage, that's it. And then the Bible says in verse 15 that whosoever looketh, no, believeth. That's the one thing that's changed. It ain't a matter of looking, it's a matter of believing. We cannot be, we cannot be saved, we cannot be prepared for eternity by looking at a cross. We have got to by faith believe in him who hung on the cross. That's right. He went there for us. He, the Bible says in verse 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Folks, that's the, that's the guarantee of this generation. That's the, that's the guarantee of the generations past us and the ones that will come on in the future if there is a future. Those who are saved who should not perish will have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who was lifted up in Calvary, who died on an old rugged cross, who shed his precious blood, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have not just life, but everlasting life. See, those Jews that was in the desert, and, and, and they looked at that serpent on the pole, they didn't die right then from the snake bite. But physically, they died later. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. They had a guarantee for a few more years on planet Earth. But if they didn't get right with Almighty God, Jehovah God, and walk with Him, worship Him, and go through the ceremonies and the sacrifices and all that they're supposed to do, they wouldn't go make it to heaven either. Listen, this Bible lays it out so plain and so true. But those of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall not perish but have not just life, but that next phrase says, but have eternal life. Yes, one day this body is going to, this life is going to die. I, I know that. And you need to know that. Nobody's going to live forever in this body. This old house that I'm living in today will be laid down. But the man who lives inside, that's the man who's going to live forever. Look, let's read on a few more verses. The Bible says in verse number 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. That serpent on the pole was not erected in the presence of those people in the desert, Jewish people, it wasn't there to condemn them, it was to save them. That's right. It was to give them life. And really should give them assurance in the God that had led them through that desert. 
My, that's what we need to have today. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Who gave Jesus to us? It was God. Just as God orchestrated a picture. See, folks, he didn't take away the servants. No, he left them. He left the servants right there. But he left, he gave them something that would protect them from death if they got bitten. I got to think about that, you know what? I'd like to think once I got saved, sin would be gone. But it ain't. <laughs> Amen. I'm just as vulnerable to sin as anybody in this room or outside of this room in this world. It's out there. It's there to tempt. It's there, it's out there to rear its ugly head and try to get me to do something that's not right. But you know what? Because I have received Jesus Christ, and I've, I've, I've got my eye on Calvary, on the Son of God. I'm not going to yield to that sin. You can, you can, I don't want to use this word, but I suppose you can, I suppose you can bet, and no, <laughs> not about in the betting business. You can just rest assured, them people who got bit and then healed, kept their eye open to the snakes. See, God didn't get the snakes, didn't remove the snakes. They were still there. You know what? When we get saved, wouldn't it be good if God would remove our old sinful nature and it wouldn't be there and we'd never be tempted anymore? Oh no. That sinful nature is still there. We're still in this old body of flesh. But we've got a new spirit in us. We've got the spirit of Christ. So the Bible lets us know here that it was God that loved the world. It was God that gave his only begotten son. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish. God, he's, he's the author. He's the presenter of salvation and life. He did it for Israel in the desert, and he's doing it for us today. He doesn't want man to die and go to hell and, 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 and to be destroyed forever. No, he wants man to live and to enjoy the life that he has even in the flesh. And look forward to the future. Look forward to an eternity in heaven. I know you have, I have. I've got loved ones, I've got grandparents and parents. Let's go now. What's my hope of ever seeing them again? That hope that I had is because of the hope that they had in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's their only hope. And if they're not saved, if they have not by it, come, come to realize that they must have Christ, we've got life, but we don't have eternal life. This body is going to go. Our life here is going to be cut off one day. But you can have eternal life. Life after death. In a new body. In a new place. With Jesus Christ. And so the Bible goes on to say that it's not a matter of looking to live. It's believing to live. Amen? And we believe in Christ by faith. Now listen, those people in the desert, bitten by them snakes, knew what they could do and what they were there to do. They like people. Look upon that pole and they see a snake up there. I just kind of have an idea that they probably backed up. Well, he said, if we look at it, took a little bit of faith, didn't you? You looked at something that was fixing to put you in a grave. That bit you and the, and the venom that was in your body. And they ain't no doctor out there that can take care of that. So by faith, you can, they looked at the serpent. It's like that pain was gone. They were destroyed. You know what? That's what happens when we get saved. We don't have to think about what's going to happen when death comes because we're not going to die, really. Not our inner man. We're going to be with him. God sent not his son. Now, I don't know whether, did you notice over there, and I was going to kind of elaborate on that, 
that God sent the serpents. Did you see that? Let me turn that over. The Bible tells us in verse number six, and the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. God sent the serpents. Guess what? God. What does it say there in, 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 uh, in, that, in that verse? For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. Why? The world was already condemned. He did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him could be saved. Verse 18 says, he, he that believeth on him, that is Jesus, is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. We're already snaked if we don't believe in Jesus. He said, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. If you just add up in those few verses I just now read, you'll find out that uh, it's listed five times. Five times in 15 through 18. Five times that the, if the necessity of believing in Jesus Christ to have everlasting life. Some say, well, I, I, I believe I can get there, but I'm just going to turn you over a new leaf. I'm just going to be doing the things I've been doing. I'm going to start being good. I'm going to go to church. You know what? That won't help you one day. Matter of fact, you'll probably have a problem in the church if you get there. Because they will not do things like you want them to. Because you don't have the same spirit. But I'll tell you what, them people in the desert, I guarantee you, when a few of them got busy, got healed, they just tell that body, if you're a bit, run to, run to that circle of hope. You have your only hope. That's what we need to be doing today. Did you know that? We need to be telling everybody that we can, no matter what you think, what you've been told in the past, you need to run to Calvary and take a look at Jesus and believe on Him by faith to accept you as, his, as, as their sin. That's right. That's what's going to be done. Over and over again. Time and time again. That's what it says. Matter of fact, I'm going to head you. will go down in that chapter and found out even down there in verse number 36. <coughs> it, well, look at verse 35 if you want to if you're handy. It says, The Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into his hands. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Mm -hmm. What is that? The judgment of God. Folks, this thing, this thing of being a Christian, it, it, it comes because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turning to Him, receiving Him, who died on that old rugged cross over 2,000 years ago, that whosoever, whosoever would believe in Him, I mean, the Word of God is so full of that. I was looking over here in the book of Romans, in chapter number 3, the Bible tells us, not just a few people, it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what the end times at today. But the Bible goes on to say, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. He has done it through Calvary. Oh, you know what, that, that ought to encourage us to want to get out and tell everybody that we can that if they don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, to share with them His love and to share with Him what He paid just so that they can be prepared to go to heaven. They have, God has done it all and all to Him we owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but His blood, His blood washed us finer than snow. 
Oh, friend of mine, faith, faith, believing, we have got to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith and accept him as our personal Savior. The Bible tells us here in the book of Romans, tells us over here in chapter 6, verse 23, for sin, for, for the sins, the wages of sin is death. The gift. The gift. Jesus Christ is God's gift. And he said, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Listen, it's not enough to be religious. It's not enough to be good. You've got to be saved by grace through faith in believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And by doing that, then we have absolutely a guarantee of going to heaven. God promises that in his word. And what a marvelous picture Israel was able to view and to experience on that day when Moses stood there told them. God sent the serpents. God gave the instructions on what to do because God was looking forward at the day that he was in his son in human flesh made of a woman born in Israel who would go to the Lord of the cross who would be lifted up that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life oh what a message what a hope we have church and what a hope we need to spread in this community. And wherever we live, wherever we work, wherever we go. People need to know the Lord. I went to <clears throat> Nichols yesterday. Went in to run in and grab my couple, three cans of cat food for my two little kids. And uh, young Indian girl was down on her knees. She was working there. She was down on her knees threw them with some stuff at the shelf and I stopped and I was looking at her. She looked up at me and kind of smiled and she said, I, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be getting up in a minute. I said, that's all right. I said, you're in a good place. I said, we don't need to be on our knees. And she looked at me and grinned and said, oh. I said, yeah. I said, are you a Christian? She said, oh yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. I said, what are you going to church? She said, well, I go over to the temple and uh, I've never heard of church. So I came back and she said, <laughs> I said, that's good. I said, don't you know the Lord Jesus? It's fine. She said, I don't know who she was. I didn't even ask for her name. I take every opportunity I can to say something to somebody if I'm out. We need to do that. You're saved on your way to heaven. You know you've got everlasting life. You ought to want someone to go with you. You ought to hope that somebody that don't know Jesus will be there. And I check them out there. Check out Stan, you know, walking around a little bit, and uh, get the credit card out, pay for the stuff, and I'll ask the lady to check him out. Are you on your way to heaven? <laughs> oh, you can surprise them sometimes. They won't, they won't say much. You take off for you know, you feel about all you need to say, you know. Listen, church. We've got a world that's going to hell mm -hmm. in a hand basket. Right. We need to get the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ out there so they might be saved. Yes. I don't know about you, I don't, I don't want anyone to go to hell. Jesus didn't want anyone to go to hell. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. But folks, he did give his son. He sent his son. God sent his son in the world. He didn't do it to condemn the world. The world was already condemned. But that the world through him might be saved. So I'm going to say today, I don't know if everybody's part in here. I don't know whether you're over your way to heaven or not. But you ought to start to think about it. Because if you're not, you ought to talk to somebody. You really can. Somebody can help you. Listen, this ain't, this ain't our final place. We're just here for a time. And we're going to leave here. And then once we do, which direction are we going to go? That is, that's the key. I drove all over the United States, big part of Canada, 
in the ministry when we was out there working on the reservations. I never got on the wrong road because I always checked to see which one to travel. And once I hit it, I went to my destination. We need to get on the right road. We need to get on the, as the old, older than the people used to say, get on the, get on the, uh, let me say the Christian road, I can't remember what they say, but it's on that way. <clears throat> and if you're, you're not on that way, please think about it. I'll be willing to talk to you. But I want to say today, let's be about the Lord's business. We're his servants, right? So So let's get in his business and let's let's just find somebody we can at least speak to anytime we're able. As we look in the word of God, we know that God loves us. The Bible says he loves us. And God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to life. Father, we want to bow in your presence this morning and praise you. Thank you for your mercy, for your grace for your examples and types in the Old Testament to show us that you've always been there. You've always been ready to help your people. And even though they murmur against you or against your servant, you're there to forgive, they'll confess sin. Father, we ask you to bless the service this morning with your presence and guidance in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>